We thank you for giving us breath in our lungs to worship you, to praise you, to declare your truth. We thank you that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We thank you that you are our provider. We thank you that you are here with us and we love you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you have the cattle on a thousand hills. And so we just we dedicate our lives to you. We dedicate our finances to you and all of these things that you would be glorified because it is yours. So we just commit this offering to you. We pray that you would multiply it for your purposes and for your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Go ahead and pass. Pass the buckets. Well, good evening. Good evening. Welcome. We are so glad that you are here. If you feel like you're too far away, you're very welcome to scoot a little closer because we're all family here. But if you're keeping the angels company, that's fine too. We don't want them to be. Um, I'm going to just give a few announcements about tomorrow so that we don't forget or in case we carry on whatever happens and, and you have to sneak out before it's over. Tomorrow morning, starting at 10 o'clock, we... Tomorrow morning, starting at 8.30, for the men in the house, for the men in the house, ladies, you get to sleep in or go for a walk or just enjoy sitting in silence. If you're like me, that's like awesome. I love when everybody leaves the house and I just, I just sit there, pray, think. <laughs> but, um, so, gentlemen, men's breakfast is tomorrow morning at 8.30, downstairs in the lower hallway. So we encourage you to come, even if you want to get out your phones real quick, to send a quick text to a couple people before Liz gets up here and be like, hey, men's breakfast tomorrow morning, 8.30, don't be late. Uh, it, pardon? Oh, 8 o'clock or 8.30? It is 8.30. So if you're here by 8, then you'll for sure be on time. If you're here at 8.30, they'll wait for you. But if you're here at 9, you can't promise that the food will still be here. Says 8.30. 8.30. We're going to go with that. Go with that. Okay. 8.30. Men, come for men's breakfast. Um, I, I'm sure that you guys will have a great time. Whatever it is, guys do it. Men's breakfast. I'm all for it. It's great. Um, and then, then at 10 o'clock, that's when the, everybody else shows up, all you ladies. We are going to have a special hands-on, interactive training get the tools, get the practice. If you're really good at evangelism, we need you to come. Because those of us who are a little rusty or feel a little intimidated by the thought of it, we need your help. And so Liz will be here, obviously. Liz is here to, to lead and to, and to train us in this. But if this is your thing and you're a little, this is like, you've already got this down, we need you to be here to help the rest of us get this down. And I firmly believe that the more we share the gospel and see people's lives changed, the more excited we become, the more the fire inside of us gets stirred up. And that becomes contagious. So that a night like this doesn't have 50 people here, but it has 500 people here because people are so excited for what the Lord is doing. And we know that there is power in the gospel. We don't need to shrink back or be worried that God's not going to show up because he's already here. So the more we can do that, we start to rub off on other people and exponential growth happens in that way of just the fire of the Holy Spirit being stirred up. So please join us tomorrow morning for some some practice, some training, some very hands-on time. And then we will take a break for, for some lunch. Those who are able to help to be here a little earlier, we'll start setting up. The, the wind blew and the rain came today, so now tomorrow there will be no rain. So praise God, that's awesome. And so we will start, we're going to start setting up at 2 o'clock got the thumb up. At 2 o'clock to get the sound equipment and the table set up, we've asked all of our volunteers to be here by 3 o'clock so that everybody can get their jobs. If you signed up for a job and you got reminded this week about showing up, I'm not assigning jobs until you're there because if something shows up and something happens in your life and you either can't come or, or you're late 
and I'm waiting to fill that spot because I told you you could do it, I, I need, we need those jobs to be filled. So that's, if, if there was confusion over, like, I said I wanted to do this, then make sure you're there on time at 3 o'clock to, to get your assignment. And um, we just need to make sure that everything's covered and taken care of because we want to represent the Lord well tomorrow. So tomorrow is going to be a great day. We're going to have a lot of fun. And another cool thing before Liz gets up here is through all of this, we just, as a ministry team, we, we spend time in prayer and meeting together and asking the Lord what we're supposed to be doing, but we hold it all openly. And for Holy Spirit, show us and guide us. And Mary called me today. Well, she texted me, do you have 10 minutes? i got to share something God showed me. And and she started to share with me this this I, idea, vision, prompting from the Holy Spirit about teaching English classes. And this is something that has actually been on my heart. So as soon as she said it, I was like, yes! And this is something that Jesse and I did in Vancouver. And it was so great to be able to offer that to people who have come to, the, there are people who were here, 20, have been here for 20 years who still don't know how to speak English, but they want to. They're just feel intimidated or they don't have the money for classes. And so we are going to, to start doing some English classes, and we need your help. If you can speak English, you can help teach English. And, and so this is something that, that we will start, we will do like, we're gonna do it for two months, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll do it again, and, and that sort of thing. So if, if you can speak English, and you have some availability and time, then please come and talk to Mary or myself so, so we can build this team to really be a strength to our community. You know, if, if you can't speak or understand English, you might, it, it, it's very scary living in a world where everybody speaks a different language and you can get taken advantage of and, and thinks you don't know what, what your rights are. You don't know how to defend yourself because of that language barrier. And so, and you might not know the stories of the Bible and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's a great tool. The Bible is a great tool to teach English. So anyway, I'm very excited for what the Lord is stirring. He has brought the nations to us, so now it's time for us to show up. So with that, without further ado, I would love to invite my wonderful sister friend Liz Doyle to come on up. The Lord had Liz and I meet in 2020, and it was just one of those Holy Spirit things. She's bringing her boyfriend with her. Her bodyguard.
This is a reported arm spine. That's my wife to be.
But this is a young lady, I'm going to pray for her. All the prayer too that Liz shared, just to pray for God to use her. Here's a scripture, Isaiah 55, it says this. Surely you will summon nations you know not. Call them, calling the nations. And nations that do not know you will hasten, will run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. For he has endowed you with splendor. The nations are running to us. They're coming here. What are we going to do? Are we going to be afraid of them? Are we going to not go to talk to them? You know, God has placed them here. God determined the times and the seasons and the exact places where people should live so that they may call upon Him and perhaps find Him because He is not far from any one of us. You can do it. It says here that the splendor of the Lord, you've been endowed with that. I'm going to pray for my wife so I know that she is able to do whatever God wants her to do and share tonight. Okay, my young lady, my young wife of 51 years now, celebrated our 50th last year, and I actually took her back to that place where we met. And the newspapers really loved that. So praise the Lord for every one of you because you are not here by chance. And this place is not here by chance. When I was, when I was traveling, and I was driving the two hours from Charlotte down to Columbia International University when we first came over here, I was working on my master's in missions and concentration on Islamic studies and pluralism. And so I, this, this was going through all the trouble at that time. And so I prayed every day that I would travel down I prayed, Lord, turn that place around. The stuff that's happened there, change it, redeem it. And you have been redeemed. You've been redeemed. And don't take it for granted. God has redeemed this place for a purpose. And you are part of it. Extremely important. So I'll share that. So praise God. Enjoy it. But open your hearts to what God wants you to do this weekend. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for Liz. I thank you she's been a faithful wife, mother, my grandmother, I shouldn't say that. Lord, anoint her, equip her tonight to share your word. Open our hearts tonight to what you want to say. We know the entrance of your word will bring light. And we need light. We need light in these days in which we live. Because we know that you are absolutely in control of everything. But yet the wonderful thing is that you can use us to share your word and bring life to the people instead of death. So I pray for Liz tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for this opportunity for her to share. And pray that you would bless every word of your anointing, the power of your Holy Spirit penetrating our hearts because we ask it, because we want to be part of what you are doing here in Antioch International Church. And we give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you, honey. Yeah, so it's great. It's good to come on the back of, yeah, Sid used to drive up here when he was working on his master's degree at Columbia International University in Columbia. And uh, it's interesting because of us being here. And I feel like be, you are, and what the the purpose, and I know I don't have to tell you what the purpose of your church is because it's already called Antioch, okay, is that this church, it should be a reflection of the day of Pentecost, okay, the reflection of the day of Pentecost. That's why this time together is very significant, and if we think about that day in Acts chapter 2, they were all together in one place, waiting on the Lord. Because he said, go up there, be obedient, and wait. Because the Holy Spirit's going to come. Alright, so they're just waiting. They didn't know what to expect. They were doing whatever you do when you wait around. They're praying, they're praying, they're praying. And then all of a sudden, as we know, a mighty wind comes through the place. Tongues of fire came on their heads. And they began speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It was so dynamic that it went into the, into the streets and people came to hear 
What on earth was the commotion? And when they got there, they heard the goodness and the great things of God in their own languages. And what was that? What was that a picture of? It was a picture of the fact that the Lord, when he left, okay, when he left, his famous last words were, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Okay? In the end times, at the beginning of the end times, I believe the same thing's going to happen. But it's full circle. People came to hear the gospel from all the nations. That's what's happening now in the United States. Yes, indeed, we're concerned about the border, but you know what? We're proactive. If God is bringing the nations to us, then we need to reach them with the gospel. Even the most wicked, horrible ones. Bring them on, Lord! We will preach the gospel to him, them, because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. But he needs a group of people who believe it. Now, some of you are here tonight, and you were not born in the United States. And maybe you were Christians before you came here. Well, you're a part of the gospel force that the Lord has brought to stand with the American church to preach the gospel. You have a particular anointing. I believe that when you go from one country to another, you have a, a peculiar boldness. One reason is because you don't know what the society expects. And even if you do, you can do whatever you want because you can plead ignorance. Hallelujah! That's what I do wherever I go. I'm just ignorant. I didn't know I couldn't talk here. You see, that's the first thing. And you have courage because this is not your country. There's a sense I, that you're on a mission, a real sense, until you sort of settle in and you're a part of the, of the framework. Well, never settle in. Always just use that edge. If you're Canadian, you can really plead ignorance. No, no, I'm only joking. <laughs> now, my husband, you know, the only, I've preached in 60 nations, and, and this is what I'm just saying. I never have preached ever in Canada. So I think they're ignorant, because they would have had me there in the they would have But I mean, let's, we'll go to another thing. You know, like, I lived, in, I lived in England for 25 years. And up to the day I left, people used to say to me, Oh, are you here on holiday? That's what they used to say to me. I said, no, I've lived in here for 25 years. But I couldn't even learn the language of English people. I tried to get the accent so I'd fit in. It sounded so bad, they thought I was making fun of them. So I just decided to be who I was. And the Lord spoke to me one day. He said, be who you are, because in fact, the fact that you are who you are is what's going to impact this culture and the church. They need your enthusiasm. They need all these things that you're bringing into, the, into this context. Your boldness, your bravery, your courage, or whatever else I have. Sid thought it was just, Sid just thought it was craziness. But I call it boldness, all right? That's what he's doing. And that's, those of you who came here as Christians, that's why you're here. You're not here because you got a good job, you're not necessarily, you're not here because of your education. You're here because God sent you here to be a part of the mission force. And then there's others that are here that you have, you have come here and you didn't know Jesus, but you do now. Because you were part of the mission field. So the mission field has come to us. And I love that because after going years just being on airplanes, flying around the world constantly, going to war zones, as Sid said, the thing about women in ministry is that nobody complains when you go to where the men don't want to go. All right? They only complain if, you know, like if I'm going to go behind the lines dealing with terrorists, everybody's happy to lay hands on me and send me out. Hallelujah. Because they're going somewhere they don't want to go. But that's where the greatest fruit is. That's where the hunger is. That's where the harvest is. Because those people need Jesus. And I've, I've stood in front of a thousand women in Sri Lanka who saw their husbands blown up and, and their children kidnapped. And terrible things happened to them. Some Tamil Tiger girls sitting right there in the front row, sent by the Tamil Tiger uh, uh, terrorists to listen to what I had to say. And I could have been killed if I said the wrong thing. 
But I preached Jesus. And at the end, the Lord said to me, I had a friend of mine, she was from Kenya. I have always take multicultural teams with me. And so at the end, the Lord said, I want you to call all those women up to the front so that you can hug them. Hug them. And show them my love. Some, and those Tamil Tiger girls had never been hugged in their life. You know, as, as babies, they were kidnapped and trained to kill people by being human bombs. That was their place in life. And when they came up to be hugged, they were like stiff. Because I probably was the first person ever to hug them. And I'm hugging them with the love of Jesus. But all of them came up with all of their diseases. You know, they had fevers. They had everything. You know, you, you took their hand, they're burning up. And then the way that they'd hug you is they, on both sides, but they go, <laughs> they spit on both sides of your cheek. Kind of like every kind of disease and germ is now coming on me. But you know what? I walk in divine health. You know, under the blood of Jesus, he wanted to love them. And every single one was loved. So many got saved. So many got delivered. So many got baptized in the Holy Spirit. These women, some only, they only had like two salaries and a pan. That's all they had. That they lived with. They were poor, impoverished. They had been Hindus. But now they were following Jesus. Isn't it wonderful? It's wonderful what the Lord does. And the opportunities he gives us if we give him our lives. You know, I want to I want to read to you from Isaiah tonight. Isaiah and I want to bring my Bible. And it says this, Isaiah 52. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings and proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Amen. And we know the song, how lovely are the mountains are, the feet of them who bring good news, good news, proclaiming peace, announcing news of happiness, our God reigns, our God reigns. How lovely on the mountains are these. The feet of them to bring. These are the shoes that we're supposed to put on in the whole armor of God. Amen? Well, these are my shoes today. I'm going to tell you a story just happened today. Here, in Fort Mill, down the street. If I get, if I get it wrong, uh, Pastor Elizabeth will help me. But I got up this morning, my feet looked terrible. I said to her, I need to have a, I got to go up and get a, a pedicure. So we arranged to go and get a pedicure just down here. And when we got in there, and I was busy all day, we're going to Washington, D.C. in a couple of weeks. We got to get all the names in, all these women are coming. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sort of focused on this mission. Uh, it's a, she's, she leads America gala and events in D.C. So I'm working away and we go in and, you know, you have your, your seat and your chair and all. And uh, I'm ushered to my seat, and I'm not really paying much attention because my mind is focused on some work I'm doing on my phone. So I sit down, and, and uh, the lady who is um, giving me a pedicure, she is, like most people, from Vietnam. So I, you know, I was aware she's from Vietnam, and she's working on my feet, and I'm just doing what I'm doing, and then I look up, and then I say to her, so, where were you born? You know, you might as well just ask straight up. And she said something, and then she, we finally got that she was born in Vietnam. So then, the first thing you do is that you find what you have in common. And what we had in common is that in 1975, we helped the both people from Vietnam, from our church in England. And they came to our town, and we used to go and see them and befriend them, and, and uh, we helped them get houses and all those practical things. Uh, I taught them English by t teaching them, thank you, Jesus, the way they sing it. Thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Lord. So that's the first thing they learned in English. Huh? 
hallelujah. Okay? So we got talking, and I said to her, I don't know what, we just talked, 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 and then I think she said, so I wasn't sure, because she had a sort of mask out on, but I think she said her dad was, I said, I said did you go to church? Were you a Christian? Because of something that she said, I sort of thought she must be a Christian, and she said, yeah. And I think she said her dad was a pastor. I think she said that. So I asked her what church she went to and all. And so we got going, and then she started talking to me about how he had passed away. And it turns out five members of her family have died. But they were Christians. So I said to her, well, you know, there's going to be a great, you know, we don't have to worry because we know we're going to heaven when we die. And then I just started singing. When we all get to heaven. I mean, my feet are being, you know, done. And uh, I just started singing. And next to me was a guy, he was African American, and he had a red beard, like red, like he painted it red. You know, and he had a little rainbow and things. And he was there next to me, his eyes were shut. And uh, Elizabeth was next to me, and then the other, you know, other people and the, so we, I just start when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we, and she started singing with me. So we had to do it. So that got going, because I thought, well, good, we're on the road now. And so we started talking some more, and we began to sing songs like, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, amazing. We did, didn't we? We had a whole concert today as I was getting my feet done. And we talked, and the girl next to us, she was um, a Catholic. But she, this girl here said, well, they, they, they're good because, you know, they believe in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And I said, yes, the three in one. Jesus came, and he came as a man, and he died on the cross in our place, and he rose again from the dead so that we know that we are have eternal life and that we're going to go to heaven. And we just kept talking. I just kept reaching away. Nobody complained. You know, it was great. We sang another couple of songs. We had a whole service. While my feet were being done. She did a great job. Then on the way out, one of the girls said, that was beautiful singing. Thank you. And the gentleman next to me said, you can really hold a tune. And then the, I asked the guy, I said, who's the manager? He said, me. I said, can we pray for your business? So in Jesus' name, we pray for his business. Okay, that's where the Holy Spirit is right now, folks. Could you do that in a white American salon? It would be hard. But they were open. Preach the gospel, have a gospel concert. Elizabeth didn't know the hymns. She needs to learn something. What would you do with her? Keep her away from hymns? What is it? What is that when she joined in? We'd have like a trio. But no, it was me and the Vietnamese lady. And we sang a duet all the way through. Isn't that great? So that's why I said to you today, how lovely on the, uh, on the mountains are the feet of them. I was wearing the shoes of the gospel of peace right there. You know, the Lord is waiting for us just to be. You know, I'm not afraid. That's what I just said. I'm from, I'm from Michigan. In Michigan, we do that all the time. So I'm in a foreign country when I come to South Carolina. I don't know what your people's, you know, social things are. I just do whatever it is. In fact, in Dearborn, Michigan, we go Christmas caroling. And we go to all the Muslims. It's 98% Muslim where we go. Door to door singing carols. Not only do we go door to door singing carols, we go into the grocery store singing carols. And we preach. Like we're standing there, and there's all these people, these Arabs from all over the world, and they've got their cell phones out, and they're taking pictures of us. And it's not because they're sending them up so some terrorists can come get us. No. It's because they think it's great. And we're preaching, Jesus came to this earth and died on the cross for you. You know, we're just open. And they love it. They think that's normal for Christians. It just isn't because nobody says it. But that's the truth. And we sing, they love it, we give them gifts, and they wait for us every year to come back to, to bring our Christmas carol. We've been doing that, what, 20 years? So we take 200 people out from around the southern Michigan, and we go Christmas caroling. 
bringing the love of God to the, those Muslim people who are unreachable in their own countries. They're mostly from Yemen. You know, they're the, from those places. And uh, it's wonderful. And they're free to do that. We go into the restaurants, we go into the tea rooms, and we sing for Jesus. We did it last year. Okay, that was pretty dangerous, because we were a bit nervous, because we had what happened in October, and there was a lot of uprising in Dearborn. So we asked them, do you still want us to come and sing carols? Yes, come and sing carols to us. So we did that, and you know what happens? It brings peace. It brings love. That's what we're supposed to do. You know, we are in the, to the ministry of reconciliation between people and people in God. But we have to put ourselves in a place to do it. And God didn't just call a few people to do it. He called us all to do it. He said to all of us, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Hallelujah! What a wonderful privilege and honor! And if all that we do is pray, it doesn't get done. Pray prepares the way. But it comes through the preaching of the word. And that's as simple as anything, because you know what? It doesn't cost you anything except your pride to talk to somebody about Jesus. I was, we were talking today, and just before this meeting, and the Lord brought something back to mind. Because I believe every morning when I get up, I'm on a mission. Because we are. Are you on a mission every morning? Are you saying, Lord, here I am? I want to be on a mission. Well, yeah, and nowadays we can go to another country by walking out our door. Hallelujah. So I'm like here tomorrow. You're going to be in India. Praise the Lord. Last time I went to India, I thought I'm never coming back here. It's too hot and there's lots of mosquitoes. <laughs> we had one of those tennis rackets that kills them. I mean, it's like machine guns. All day long at night. I mean, it was so terrible. I thought, I don't ever want to come back here. And I've been there a lot, but it seems like there's more mosquitoes. I think they left Michigan. And they've gone to India. Because we don't have any now, but I've never seen so many mosquitoes in my life so we're in India. And I thank God that I can come to South Carolina and I can reach India here. Hallelujah. Without all the bad stuff. So here we are. We are, um, what was I saying? It was good what I said. Oh, yeah. What's that? Every morning we're on a mission. So, you know, sometimes I say, and I don't try to, because I think when I'm on a plane, I get a bit of peace and quiet. But sometimes I get on planes, and there's somebody next to me, and when they're not next to me, then I know that they're called. So the other day, there was a guy next to me, and I said, hello, he goes, hello, I said, what you doing? He just said a little bit, and he goes, you know, I'm right now, I'm sort of in transition. I'm making decisions. I said, oh, good. I said, because I'm in the business of being a new life coach. <laughs> I can help you with your decisions. And I really enjoy doing that. I'm a new life coach. Oh, what is that? I'm helping you to find out what, what, what God's plan for your life is. Well, he was intrigued. You know, like, well, what do you think? You know, and I just began to talk to him. And he listened. Not our way up. And that brought me to this one. This is a really good one. We were in Windsor Castle. Pastor Joy was with us. And we were having a consultation of all these leaders. So I got on a plane, and we got on a plane to go to Northern Ireland to, to meet Sid's family. And I was sitting next to a very nice young woman. And as we sat down, I said, well, are you on your way to Ireland? And she said, yes. And, and I said, oh, well, what takes you there? She goes, well, I am. Uh, I'm, I'm going to a consultation. No, I've been to a consultation in England. And I said, so have I. I said, what was yours about? She said, it was about the colonization and the, you know, the, the evils of colonization. And she was a, a professor in uh, a, a, the, the big university in Belfast, Queen's University. She's a professor of anthropology in Queen's University. And I said, well, I just came back from a consultation, and I was at Windsor Castle. Really? I said, yeah, what was that about? I said, well, we met with all these top women in um, all these different uh, levels of, of 
you know, across sectors of society. It's funny because I become very smart when I talk to smart people. It's sort of like speaking in tongues. You know, like I have the tongues for the dumb people and I got the tongues for the smart people. You know, I can even speak in tongues. When I'm talking to an educationalist, I even use their language. It's so amazing. It's coming out of my mouth. I think, where's that coming from? I have just got a PhD in education. It's unreal. And so people trust me because they think I know what they're talking about. I have no idea. I'm just saying the right words as I'm speaking in God's tongues, the languages they understand. So I started in some kind of language that she understood, and she became very interested. And I talked about the fact we are ladies that have shared values right across society, and we were invited as Americans to come and meet with our British counterparts in Windsor Castle to discuss what is happening in society today and to find solutions for the problems that we're facing. She was very intrigued. Oh, yes, really? I said, yes, it was amazing. So I talked to her a little bit about her left-wing ideas about colonization and how wicked it was, you know, how uh, the British went into these countries and, and brought medicine and, and gave them roads. You know, they, they hate all that stuff. Well, that's not how they put it, but that's what they're saying. So I'm just waiting for her to be finished, and then I talk to her, I began to speak to her about what we were talking about. And as we talked, I said, I said, the reason that we have shared values is because we all know Jesus Christ. We are Christian women, professional Christian women. And she said, well, I'm an atheist. So I said, oh, are you? Yes, she goes, yeah, I'm an atheist, and uh, me and my wife, so then she said, I'm atheist and I'm gay. She, you know, she thought she might as well just pour it all out there. And on top of that, she was paralyzed. Okay? So I started talking to her about her condition. Well, have you always been paralyzed? I mean, what is, you know, what happened? Well, I talked to her about that. And her and her wife just had a baby. So I said, well, that's interesting. You know, oh, okay. But I didn't go into it. I just, oh. And she's talking to me about her private life, which I thought was wonderful. And so then as we talked more, I, I said to her, she said, and we just talked. I just said, yes, I find that as I follow Christ, you know, he does all these wonderful things because he loves people, he cares about people. He wants the best for all of us. And I said, I find it quite remarkable that so many people, I said, I'm the founder and the director of this, and I'm quite remarkable that all these women come. She goes, well, I don't find it remarkable. You are a very engaging person. I think that you are, you know, you're an amazing person. You know, she's talking like that, and I'm thinking, the favor of God is on me right now. I love that deer in the headlights thing. You know, like, your enemies love you. I just think this is the best thing yet, so I really bask in that stuff. You know, because when she comes out of it, she may not like me anymore. In fact, I used to win people to Christ, and they would say to me a couple months later, when I met you, I thought you were the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen in my life. But now I see her just like everybody else. I said, yeah, thank you. Let's go back a few, a few weeks. That's the favor of the Lord that rests on us. When we bring his love, people see Jesus in us. So in the end, do you know what she said to me? I said, she said to me, I'm curious. How did you come to find Christ? What's your story? How did you come to know God? And I began, I told her the whole gospel. I said, I didn't know that Jesus died on the cross in my place. And I told her the whole thing. And that he, you know, died on the cross to forgive my sins. That he rose again from the dead. You know, I just told her the whole thing. And she just, she did not reject it at all. She just took it in. Who knows if anybody ever told her right. what it meant to follow Jesus. Right. And then at the end, before we left, I said, do you mind if I pray for you? I really, and I said, you know, I really admire you. That you, you know, even with all of the adversity that you faced, you've done so well in your career and all that's happening. Do you mind if I pray for you? And she said, oh, go ahead. So I prayed for her healing. I prayed that she'd come to know Christ. I prayed for everything. And she was good with it. Don't you think that's amazing? Yeah. Yes. Amen. Yes. But that is, that is, the first thing when you meet people is you find out, you know, we, we all share something. And that's common humanity. It doesn't matter if they are. We are all people. And all of us need a Savior because we have all failed somewhere. So without Christ, you are walking in
in shame and guilt. And it doesn't matter how, how haughty somebody is, or they might act like they know it all. They know they don't. And they're struggling through life without God. We have to remember that. I remember leading a Chinese lady to the Lord, and she said to me afterwards, I'm relieved that there's somebody greater than me, that I can turn to somebody greater than myself. Wow. Yes. But we don't realize that sometimes we've been Christians for so long, we forget what it's like to be lost. Yes. We forget what it's like that the only people that you can rely on is President Trump or Kamala Harris. I mean, face it, that's who people are trusting in right. for their whole lives right. if they don't know Jesus. Yes. yes. That's pretty scary. Yes. yes. Okay? That is really scary. Yes. And right now is like the perfect time to reach people for Jesus. Amen. Because who else do they have to turn to? Nobody. There's nobody. Because there's somebody over them that poses a threat, and that's how they see it. If they're Democrats, they think the Republicans pose the threat, and if they're Republicans, they think the Democrats pose a threat. Right. Well, we know who poses a threat. Right. It's the devil. Yes. And we know the answer is Jesus, yes. the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yes. Amen? Yes. And we have a Jesus who saved us. We have a Jesus who's greater than anybody else. We have a Jesus that can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and however he wants. All we need to do is obey him and trust him. Now, I shared last night quickly over some words, and I want to share the same words that I shared last night tonight with you, because I want to encourage us all. First of all, I'm thrilled to see you all here tonight. You know, it's not, um, I said the Lord gave uh, me two assignments, and my husband as well. Like the hardest things to do in the kingdom of God is to be an evangelist, because nobody wants to hear from an evangelist. So I really, I really thank you guys. Sid and I haven't been invited to preach anywhere for a long time, unless we set up our meetings. Because pastors are threatened by evangelists. Because that means he might have to go out and do some work and win people to Christ. And he knows I'm going to do that. Okay? So it's like, don't bring her in here because she upsets the people. They all want to go out now. And I'm going to have to go with them. And I'm going to go play golf. Leave me alone. You know what I mean? So the thing is, is that God is calling us out. All right? And you've got pastors here. And they took the risk. And they brought us in. Because they want to see people come to Jesus. Yes. And the way they're going to come to Jesus is when we go and we bring them in here. Yes. That's how it happens. Yes. So anyway, um, I'm really grateful because all of you that are here, there's enough of us in the special forces in this room right now that can turn Fort Mills around. We can we're special forces. Why do you say that? Because you actually want to do this. Okay? The other thing I love about evangelists, and I used to do, in England, I'd do like bring a thousand women to a meeting, and then I would train them how to evangelize. So then I would say, in this group, how many of you actually feel you have the gift of evangelism? And there were maybe be 50 come up, right? And they were the most unlikely people you've ever seen. You'd have a bag lady. You'd have a woman standing next to her with pearls. You'd have a teenage, like, looking like, you know, a teenage girl, just regular, like in a school uniform. Then you'd have a punk rock girl next to her. I mean, the, the mixture and the variety was incredible. You know, when you, when you say to mostly people that, okay, how many of you call me pastors? These guys walk up now look cool, like him. Yeah. Still doing it. 
and she gets to the checkout. And I'm thinking, I really want to go home. Right? She's 93. She's got her checkbook and she writes real slow. <laughs> you know, looks up at the guy, how can I pray for you? Like that. And then he'll say, well, and he'll have something really serious that he can pray for. And my mom talks slow. Lord Jesus, we come to you, know, because she doesn't think so fast. So she's thinking about it, and she's slow, and, and the line just gets bigger <laughs> behind us. And then some will say, can you pray for me too? I'm thinking, I want to go home. <laughs> you know, the end, she's got a prayer line in Walmart. <laughs> and the thing is, is you would never guess it. She's a 93-year-old woman who's, you know, just in an hour. My mom, I'm telling you, my mother in our house, to get out of her recliner, you know, she out of the recliner, she gets her push thing, her walker. Then she comes, <gasps> you put her behind a shopping cart. For an hour and a half, she speeds around Walmart, and you cannot find that woman anywhere. She has got really sad life in Walmart. She tears through, she knows everything is. I can't, Sid goes, and he calls me, I can't find mom. I said, Keep looking. She's there somewhere. She's there somewhere. Okay? And that's, you know, that's it. She, when she's out with people, she becomes a different person. Yeah. And you know what? That's what happens to us. If we're on a mission, we become a different person. If we realize we're on a mission, we become a different person. We have a lease of life. We've got a reason to live. Hallelujah. And they're like the most unlikely people. And you know, and, and there's a cringe factor that's huge. You know, if you're with them, I mean, I don't know what Elizabeth thought today, but when I start singing, Blessed Assure, you know, it's a cringe factor of a hundred for most Christians. Like, oh my gosh, what about me? Oh, my reputation. I take this woman around who sings hymns, hymns, not choruses, hymns. In the nail salon, for crying out loud. But thankfully, she was sort of in disguise. She didn't have makeup on, and she was looking a little bit, you know, unrecognizable. <laughs> Somebody said to her, is that you, Elizabeth? And I think when she said yes, she was a little bit like, yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> there is a cringe factor when you hang out with the evangelists who don't know what they're going to do next. And I'm the worst, because I just, I just erupt into some weird thing. And it brings breakthrough. Did you know that? Don't you think when Jesus bent down and he took that dirt and he spit in it and he put, I mean, that's a cringe factor. I mean, the disciples are saying, Jesus, what are you doing? Putting mud in your face. Oh, my goodness. What are they going to say about you? You know, the spitting evangelist. You know, there's a cringe factor. But it brought healing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay? You don't have to be religious. Religion scares people to death. Find where you connect and begin to speak with them. There are so many people that have been on mission. You know, they've been on mission here, there, and everywhere. I mean, you just have to walk into McDonald's. If you've been on mission in Nicaragua, you know that people in Nicaragua have silver sort of caps on their teeth. Silver, not gold. So if they smile and they have silver, you know they're from Nicaragua. And then I just say, hey, I've been there. Are you from Nicaragua? Yeah, well, I've been there. You have? Oh, yes, I love Nicaraguan people. And you've connected just like that. Where did you live? Da, 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 da. And you have this whole new friendship that you didn't have. That's the same with any country you've been to. Connect. That's why God sent you on that mission trip. Not to give you a nice holiday, but to give you a place to connect in this country with those people that he sent you here. Wow. Amen? Amen? So the first thing I want you to remember, some words I used the other day, the first thing that you need to remember is that you are, now I just had I had a whole bunch of emails came in. This is why I don't like to use my phone. But I didn't want to look weird bringing a piece of paper up here, and I don't know why I just didn't do it. You are at an advantage. Don't you love that? Yeah. I could be one of the better. 
Because they don't know what they're talking about. If they're not Christians, they don't know anything about it. You have become an, an, an expert overnight. You now know more than they do. Doesn't that make you feel good? Especially if you're not somebody who's maybe graduated with a PhD. You actually know more than they do. And in this day and age, you know a lot more than they do. Because you understand common sense. Right. And I always say this to people, you know the difference between a man and a woman. Hallelujah! I mean, I go into a room now and I know more than the doctor sitting in front of me. And it makes me feel good. I was in London once and these two Swiss girls came up to me and they were going to argue with me about the Bible. And I said, excuse me, stop. And they said, yes. I said, have you ever read the Bible? All the way through? They go, no. Well, I have and studied it. I know what I'm talking about, and you do not. Okay? Why not? They just shut up. I was over. I am the expert. You are the student. And I will teach you now. Okay? Be humble about it. It's true. It's complete humility. Just say it. Say the truth. Secondly, we're an advantage. The second thing is that we need to be accurate. So you need to know the Word of God. And this is what we're going to talk about tomorrow. You know, have accuracy. Know your word. Know the word of God. And know that it's so simple being an evangelist. I love it so much. You have to know like five verses to bring somebody to Christ. And the, the thing is that we all are come in a humble way because the situation is, is that all of us are sinners. It's just that we acknowledged it. And the Lord forgave us. And they had that opportunity as well. Because they're guilty. That's why they're on drugs. They're carrying all this stuff in their head. That's why they're drinking. They have rejection in their life. That's why they'll do anything to have a relationship with somebody. Okay? That, that's just the, the way it is. So what we need to do is just be accurate and know the Word of God. Now, people don't like using the Word of God. But the Word of God is powerful. The Word of God brings revelation. When I say that this holy book that I'm holding, the Bible, says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to heaven except through him. And then begin to explain, for all of us have sinned. And the Bible says we've come short of God's glory. It doesn't matter how good you are. There's something you did once, at least in your life, that has separated you from God. That you need to be forgiven of. Of course there is. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When I talked to that professor on that airplane, I told her, I said, I did not realize that when Jesus died on the cross, that he was a sacrifice for my sin. That he was paying the price for my sin. Now when you think of it just, you know, in a technical sort of way, it's like, oh well, but when it's combined with faith, because what happens is revelation comes into our hearts. It doesn't matter if we're Hindu, Buddhist, atheist, Christian, or what. All of a sudden, the cross makes sense. That's how every single one of us in this room got saved. The cross made sense at that moment in time. And we said yes to Jesus. We received the gift of eternal life. Isn't that beautiful? And I was relieved when I knew that it was by grace that I was saved, not by my works. Because the Lord is just saying, it's for you. It's a free gift. Now, we think, you know, I, I talked to people, they were like, you know, four spiritual laws. Oh, that's old, old school. It is not. It's the Word of God. And the Word of God never returns void. And the truth of the matter is, People that don't know Christ have never heard that message. It's not old to them. It may be old to you, and you haven't even used it in 25 years, but it's not old to them. It's revelation. Jesus died on the cross in my place. I can be forgiven of all this sin. And nowadays, sin is so hard and so big and so awful that people are desperate to be forgiven by God. They just don't know it because nobody's told them. And how can they know if nobody tells them? That's what the Bible says. So we have to be 
accurate, we need to know the word and what it says, and you don't need to know very much. That's even better. You know, if you're a new Christian, you can go out and meet tons of people. Because it's so new and fresh to you. And everybody you know are sinners. But with us, if you've been a Christian for a while, you've got to go find them. Well, tomorrow, there's going to be a whole bunch of them out there. You know, in the neighborhoods. These are people that have never heard the gospel. These are people that's all going to be totally new to them. They have another religion. But you know what? That religion does not satisfy. That religion does not fill that God filled back. It just does not. Religion will take you straight to hell. We were in London um, during that time we were in Windsor. And we went into a travel agent. And this is how the Lord does it. I'm looking for a bus. I needed a, a tour of London to take all my ladies on. And so I looked it up. And I saw there was one tour company that did the tour that I wanted. But I didn't know how to get onto it. And we came up out of like the subway. And there it was, a shop that said, it was like Royal Tours or something, I can't remember. And I thought, well, there's the store, there's the shop. So it's good, you know, like God showed me that one. There's a whole bunch of them in London, but that was a brand. I went across there, and there was a Brazilian girl in there. Really nice. And I just said, oh, we need a, we need a tour of London, and I've got all these women here, and we've been at Windsor Castle, because you can really use that as a great calling card. And I, I believe Joy was there, weren't you, Joy? Yes. And um, so I'm talking to her and this and that. And I said, I don't even know how we got into about being Christian or whatever. And she said, my friends are, you know, Christian. And she was so religious, sort of religious. And I said, oh, religion will take you straight to hell. <laughs> I said, I don't know. And she goes, yeah, you're right. Because she didn't like religion. <laughs> well, that's good. You need Jesus. Jesus is the one that gets you to heaven. And then she said, on her way to work that day, she was listening to a podcast. It was about how, you know, pay attention to what happens in your life during the day. You know, people that come into your life, they have a message for you. And she goes, this is like a neon sign telling me I need to know Jesus. And I said, yes, yes, yes. You need to know Jesus. And we prayed for her to come to Christ. As quick as that. But if I had mentioned my identity as a Christian and my friend's identities as Christians, we would never have said anything. It would have been buy a ticket and go. That's good. And the other women outside, because they're carnal, they're saying, Why are you? Here, hurry up. We're going to miss the day. I said, We're winning people to Christ. And so Jolene Otter says, She's a commissioner of salvation. And she goes, I knew they were doing something like that. You know, they're in their ministry. These other women are so carnal. I said, I know they are. People need to get saved. You can see London from heaven when you die. I don't know. But you know, God has a mission for us, so we need to be accurate. And we need to be authentic. Okay? You know, if you're one day you're like living like a, the devil, and the next day you're you're trying to win people to Christ. I mean you are identifying with them. Let's face it. You know, you're just like them and oh dear. But that's not the way. The way is be authentic. It becomes your lifestyle. You know, and then when it's your lifestyle, you don't seem weird. You know, you don't, you, you don't feel like you worked it up and it all happened. It just happens. Right. It flows from you. Yeah. Nobody, I don't know, I mean, I don't ever think, but it could be my imagination, that people think I'm weird. They may think I'm really weird, but I don't know that. It doesn't seem like it when I talk to them, because it is who I actually am. And if you are actually someone who's bringing good news, if you're actually someone who's on a mission, if you're actually someone who really cares about people, if you're actually someone who said, Jesus, fill my heart with love for these people, and help me, Lord, that they know they're seen and they're heard by me, and by you, and you're being authentic, they want to talk to you. Because there's so many fakes out there. Everybody's a fake. But when you actually care, it's huge. And that's why you're here tonight, because you do. You care about these people. You've got an understanding that God has brought them here. They are your mission field. You don't have to travel. And some of you have traveled in the past. And like me, you are rejoicing that they're here. Amen? I'm thrilled. I'm going to teach you how to speak to people from other cultures. And I'm going to show you the Jesus way. Because he did it. And he shows us how to do it. And then... We have to take action. Okay, so tonight 
we're here, we're talking about this, and you're all on my side. There's nobody here that looks like they don't like what I'm saying. A couple of you fall asleep, but besides that, <laughs> I'm used to that because Sid does all the time. <laughs> no, no, really, none of you are falling asleep. I think this is amazing. And you know, if you are scowling at me, I'll come see you afterwards because I have this thing. I just have a challenge, you know, a challenge. But the other thing, too, about being authentic is, do you know Jesus? Now, I don't see any of you looking too, too, too nervous, like I'm going to come get you. So I think you all know Jesus. But you can't, I mean, I have, I've taken people with me. I've trained them how to bring people to Christ who have themselves not been Christians. I didn't realize that until we got out there. And they prayed for some people, and they got saved. And they came back, and they said, could you pray with me? Because I don't even know the Lord. Isn't that cool? That just shows you the power of the Word of God. It's not about the, ve the vessel. I mean, those guys, they were chicks with this one girl. She's a teenager. She went out with me and she's praying with people. And then she came back she goes, you know, I don't know Jesus, so could you please pray for me? I said, well, no, let's do that. You know, it's sort of like. But it is the Word of God. It is the power of God and salvation for those who believe. And the good thing is, is that we're not responsible. I know that people don't like it when I say this. Our responsibility at this point, as evangelists, we're going out with the good news, is to share the message, to pray with them to come to Christ. And, and then after that, you know, your responsibility would be bring them to church or, you know, help them. But you're not responsible to keep them saved. The Holy Spirit will keep them saved. Your responsibility is to help them along the, the way, to find a good church, to find good fellowship, to understand the Bible, you know, as much as you can. But God is the one who does the work. Because I do a lot of street work. Like, I'll meet people randomly, and I lead them to Christ. And I'm not there. I leave the country. I'm not there to look after them. I don't know anybody, necessarily. But I remember, I'll finish with this, because I want to encourage you in this, because people tell me things like, oh yeah, that's fine, but who does the follow-up? Jesus does the follow-up. Okay, he does it. Whether you bring him to church or not, he still does the follow-up. He's, he's the best one at follow-up, Holy Spirit. But I was there, and I was in England for a little bit. I was in another town. Somebody brought their friend to a dinner. She came to Christ, and she was from Denmark. Okay, I could, I'm not going to Denmark. I've never been to Denmark. If you want to invite me to Canada or Denmark, I'd love to go. That would be much nicer than ending up in the jungles of somewhere. Because I hate mosquitoes and snakes and sweating. I want to go somewhere civilized, okay? Just put that word out quickly. So anyhow, I went, I led her to Christ, and that was it. I didn't have her after I said anything. Those were the days before I that. About eight years later, eight years later, I go back to the, my town, which was not even the town that I was in originally, and a friend of mine wanted to give me a phone number of somebody, and she took a card out, and she wrote the phone number, and when I turned it over, oh no, she was in um, like a, a health club, and the person that was doing the work on her, okay, she was um, there, and she was you know, massaging her and stuff. And so afterwards, she gave her her card. And, oh, yeah, she went her number. My friend took out a card. And the card was my name, because it was some card that she'd had from years before. And she, was, she goes, excuse me, I know that lady. She prayed for me to come to Christ five years ago. And I've been looking for a church in this town. Do you know her? She goes, oh, yeah, she was my pastor. Well, where do you go to church? Oh, I go to this church. Well, can I come to that church Sunday? <laughs> okay? What was that? The Lord followed her up. And actually, she had gone back to Denmark. She would come back to live in the town where we were from. She was then doing a massage on one of the women in our church. And by chance, God's divine appointment, she saw the card, and she ended up in our church. Amen. Wow! Amen. That's a coincidence. <laughs> Nothing of these things are coincidences. God has his hand on the lives of people. And the minute you say yes to Jesus, he does not let go. He will be 
walking with you, watching and organizing things. But he uses us to answer the prayers of his heart. Yes. He's waiting for us to be the answer to that mother's prayer who's praying for her wayward daughter. She's using us to be the answer to prayer for a, a, a dad or a mom or a friend. And we need to be ready. We need to be willing. And, and God wants to use us. So I just encourage you tonight to come tomorrow because I want to share with you those things. There's a lot of things that the Lord has shown me how to evangelize in the power of the Holy Spirit. How to evangelize listening to the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus teaches it in his word. He did it himself. I've never heard anybody teach this before, and I want to teach it to you guys. You can be the, you can be the, I've taught it to university students, and it works for them, great. But I want you to learn. I just want ordinary people to learn how to evangelize in the Jesus way. Amen? Amen. Did you enjoy it tonight? Yes. 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 How many are coming tomorrow? I'm holding you accountable. <laughs> okay? Try to come. You know, if you had something else planned, hey, if you're going to go visit somebody, bring them with you tomorrow. Don't just say, I'm going to go visit so-and-so. Call them and say, we have an appointment with Jesus today, today. Come with me. And bring them. That's the first thing that you learn as an evangelist is how to bring people to church. Bring them to church. And I say to people, if they come to church and they don't know Jesus, they will know Jesus if you bring them. Especially if, if I'm preaching, they will because I'll know who it is. If they don't respond, I'll go to the door and I'll ask them why. And then they'll pray in his age. Amen? Let's get these people saved and in heaven in Jesus' name. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So yeah, let me echo that. Please be here, 10 o'clock. And then please, if you can't make it, if it's possible, make sure that you join us at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock. The actual event in the parking lot starts at 4 o'clock. It'll go till 6. Flavors of the Nations, we have a dozen or so people making uh, some specialties from their nation. So invite your neighbors. Invite even just whoever you can. This is a, an opportunity for the people that are on your hearts or the people that you meet tomorrow at the gas station. Say, hey, I'm going to this event where there's all sorts of food from different fest you know, so Flavors of the Nations Festival. Everyone loves to eat and everyone needs Jesus. So I encourage you to do that. Just stand. We're going to close in prayer. Ask the Lord to seal his word and fill us with his fire tonight. Amen? Amen. Hold out your hands. Father, we thank you for the word tonight. We thank you, Lord, that we belong to you. Lord, that you found us, you saved us, you rescued us, you lifted us out, Lord, of the ash, and you set us up on high, Lord, as your sons and your daughters. And Lord, we thank you that your heart beats for the people of this community who have come from so many different nations, Lord, and we thank you for this divine opportunity, Lord, this weekend, God, where we can introduce people to you, and God, we pray that this would be the open door, the beginning of a new chapter, Lord, for this community, Lord, that they would come to know Jesus, Lord, and it would spread like wildfire. We say, Father, use us, God, fill us, here we are, God, send us. Lord, we thank you for bringing the loss in, in, in advance, Lord. We thank you for the salvations that will happen tomorrow, Lord. And we commit it to you, God, because you are able to do more than we can think or ask or imagine. And your heart is that none should perish, but all would find you in everlasting life. And so we commit ourselves to this task now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. See you tomorrow morning. Guys at 8.30, the rest of you at 10.